Hello, I'm speaking to Paul Clitoro, the co-founder of IPAC Securities, an Australian company he founded in 1983 uh, and today manages more than $17 billion for clients in Australia and around the world. Paul is also known as a leading advocate of financial literacy and consumer protection in his home country, Australia. We're talking to him today to get a sense of how financial literacy is evolving in Australia and what should the financial services community do to build protection for consumers in a way that is commercially viable. Paul, thank you very much for talking to us today. Tell us a little bit more about the initiatives that you're putting in place in, in financial literacy in Australia. I chair the federal government's financial literacy board. Uh, we've actually been, we've been going now for some five years. The primary focus uh, of the financial literacy board on behalf of the government is actually initially uh, to write a national strategy. And fairly obviously our national strategy says that financial literacy be a good thing. The reason that we're so keen on this is that I think like most countries, we're having this debate between Particularly in an economic crisis, many consumers have had very bad investment experiences. In Australia, we've had a number of very high profile collapses and uh, some so retail consumers have actually been dealt some quite hard blows. So funnily enough, the financial crisis is a wonderful time for financial literacy because a boom disguises risk. It's only in a bust that we often see that some of the highly geared schemes were just schemes. So what we're doing in Australia is, uh, is we're starting off with a schooling system. We now have a situation where we've now got all Australian children from kindergarten to year 10 are being taught money skills as part of their core curriculum. In other words, it's in maths, English, science and so on. Okay. Now we believe what we're doing there in schools and universities and with apprentices who are learning a, uh, a trade, like an electrician or a plumber. By teaching all of these under 21 year old Australians money skills, we know we'll get a positive outcome in a decade but it will take a full decade. Uh, we're also increasingly working with adults, particularly in this downturn, and we have workplace training around financial literacy, and also, of course, special interest groups, retirees and so on. But look, the reason it's such an important debate, and why is the Australian government leading this debate? It's because what is the right balance between knowledge and regulation? We can't have a government treasury official sitting alongside every Australian consumer and say, no, 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 don't do that, don't do this, They're too much risk. Okay. So we have to, humans have to take responsibility. Right. And, and this is where financial literacy, I think, is a powerful tool. Now, financial literacy is something that you ought to teach kids along with cooking and camping, um, more than history and geography, basically, so that that's survival skills as they, they grow old. As you were putting together the, the foundation, as you call it, there would be different interpretations as to what financial literacy should be. And the banks would interpret it in a certain way. The government would interpret it in a certain way. The school system would interpret it in a certain ways. Go back to 2004 and tell us um, how are the different stakeholders interpreting financial literacy? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And um, by the way, I've got to say, actually, the banks have been amongst the biggest supporters, uh, which has been terrific. But what was interesting, though, is that I think where, if you like, mistakes were made is, for example, the stock exchange was very excited. They thought we'd be teaching children how to do options trading. Um, so, yeah, different stakeholders have different views. Look, the, the easiest definition I can give you, and in a sense, if you like, is I had two bank chief executives on my board. So I had a, a very high profile board of social, Smith family, bankers, the chief executive of AMP. So I had a, a really, a genuinely, and, and consumer advocates, uh, legal aid and the consumer credit, financial counsellors. And so I had a very powerful, all encompassing board. So the nice thing was, in a sense, is we really had a blank sheet of paper. And the thing that we got very quick agreement to is that financial literacy is a statement of basic hygiene. Okay. So in other words, basic hygiene, clean your teeth, that right. sort of thing. Right. Basic hygiene. Uh, who funded the foundation? Oh, it's government funded. Okay. Oh, no. This is a big one. In America, for example, if you take a look at the, uh, the Jumpstart initiative in America, which is working with school children, right. it's funded by a credit card company. Okay. And one of the things I said to government is I volunteer my time for this and my board volunteers. And we said, as a board, we said to government, we're happy to do this, but this is a community initiative and the best way to fund it is through the community's resources, which is through the tax system through government. Uh, in other words, we don't need to represent a fund manager or a bank or anyone else. It, this is a community initiative. It's funded by the community through our tax system. Right. Given the fact that financial well-being is something that all of us should have, what's different in terms of uh, creating financial literacy for kids 
um, and for adults. Um, and, and because it's a moving target. As well, no, right? no, but, no, but some of the principles are simple. Uh, if you're good with money, I'm pretty good with money. I'm 53. One of the reasons I'm pretty good with money is in my day as a child, there was no credit, no mobile phone, no credit card. Right. If I didn't have cash in my pocket, I couldn't spend it. Right. Money's become invisible. Right. And in a funny way, often the children's worst coach in this modern world is their own parents who are struggling to cope. In Australia, we've got $42 odd billion on credit cards. and So in many ways, if you like, the parent themselves is struggling to deal with invisible money. The child, when you go shopping, pieces of plastic. When you go down a road toll, a plastic thing on your windscreen beeps. You know, these days, whether you've got money in your wallet or not is nearly irrelevant. So money's become invisible. And our great concern is, and what we're really excited about, is that children who are going through their financial literacy training, the schooling system, are going home to mum and dad and saying, mum and dad, have we got one of those credit cards? Right. Mum and dad, do we have a family budget? Right. And what we're getting now is we're getting our parents and citizens associations are actually now starting to run evening classes for parents who can't answer financial literacy questions that children give them. Right. So financial literacy is really, it's like a snowball. And we're trying to build momentum. And it, if seven-year-old Jane come home, comes home and says to her mum or dad, mummy or daddy, do we have one of those credit cards and have we paid it off inside the interest-free period? I think that's just fantastic. Right. In the U.S., uh, you have um, you know, very nationally available programs like Susie Orman, for example. Do you have that, the equivalent of that in Australia? And I, I... The, the, look, there's, been, there's a number of uh, my, my money program is one, one such example, which I, I think is really wouldn't have happened even 15 years ago. But what we're doing with the financial literacy strategy is that we're working with television, journalists, newspapers. The reason I'm doing this today, to be quite honest, is this is a conversation about financial literacy. And what you're doing is really is you're shaping human behavior. This is, there are no quick solutions to this. We are not going to solve financial literacy in five, 10, or even 15 years. You know, this is going to be a generational issue because we don't have any natural sense of self-preservation with money. If I say to you, um, come on, let's, let's run across a busy Singapore main road to get to the other side quickly, you'll say, no, Paul, no, we'll be, we'll be killed. Wait for the traffic lights. Right. What we find in focus groups is if I show you two investments, one investment is promising 8%, one promises 12%. And I ask you, which one would you like and what is the difference? You say, well, many consumers say, well, if that's 8 and that's 12, I want 12 and yet they don't understand they're doing the equivalent of jumping in front of a moving car. Right. And we've got to give people this basic understanding of risk and return. Right. If it looks too good to be true, it will be. The government that um, supported you in setting up the Financial Literacy Foundation is not the government that is funding it today. Uh, and the government today has put you under the purview of the Securities Commission. Basically, the, the previous government, we did financial literacy out of Treasury. Uh, to the credit of this new government, what would normally happen is as chairman of, I was John Howard appointed, the previous Prime Minister. To the credit of this government, they looked at a whole range of Liberal bodies and some they did change completely. But in the case of financial literacy, the new government, I, I offered to resign. I'm a Liberal appointee, previous government. Okay. I offered to resign and this government said, no, we've looked at what you're doing, it's really important, will you please keep doing it? The only thing this government said is, look, inside our Securities Commission, we are doing investor education. We would like to have all consumer education coming out of one government body. We actually would prefer not to have Treasury working around non like savings and credit cards and debt and so on, and having our Securities Commission tackling investment issues. So what they asked me is, would I be willing to take the financial literacy program into ASIC, our securities regulator, but I have completely open book. Financial literacy has not changed. What we have done, though, is we're doing all investor education and retail education, schools education. We're simply doing it in one place. And to be quite honest, I, I could not disagree with you. Having different government bodies all doing the same thing. Right. So, no, we're doing our national strategy has not changed. Uh, the difference is we now have responsibility for the entire strategy, including investor education, which personally I think is wonderful. Right.